So 1990, part five and six, I put together originally, um, and I called it From Startup Nation to Vaccination, uh, because Startup Nation, that book that hopefully you all have on your bookshelf, tells the story of the secret sauce that made Israel into this incredible high-tech, uh, biotech, uh, fintech, um, uh, cybersecurity powerhouse that it is today. We'll talk a little bit about that this week and next week, and I'll end with uh, vaccination. That's me getting my vaccine in March. I got it late. We started in Israel, we'll see next week in December of 2020, but I had had corona in October of 2020, so they only vaccinated me in March. But that's a little bit more next week. So that's the next two weeks. A lot of politics have happened. Uh, I'm going to start with the election of this man, Ehud Barak, the most decorated IDF soldier ever, involved in many of the raids, including the uh, uh, the freeing of the hostages in the Sabena airplane, together, by the way, with Netanyahu. They were both members of the most elite of the special forces units of the IDF, the reconnaissance unit of the commander in chief. And in 1999, he had been defense minister under Rabin. He then runs and wins the election in a uh, direct election the second time for prime minister. Remember last week I mentioned how Netanyahu eked out a less than 30,000 vote margin over Perez. Barak defeats Netanyahu by a significant percentage of popular vote. We'd never had this before. Why? It's only the second time we had a ballot directly for the prime minister. Last week it was less than a percent, remember, between Netanyahu and Perez. And now we're talking about a very large 12% gap. It's as if, I'm not going to talk about American politics, but whatever. Um, but look at what happened. He got more than any other leader ever received popular votes in this country. But his party had 26 seats in the Knesset. Now, to remind you, the Knesset has 120 seats. Try being prime minister. When you, I mean, it's kind of like being I don't know, a Republican prime, uh, president and having a, uh, a 75, per, uh, 25% minority in the House and in the Senate. Good luck. You're not going to pass any legislation. So he had a government. He had His own party had only 26 of 120 seats, whereas Netanyahu's Likud had 19. He had to form a coalition, which was very wide. And he didn't have a lot of power. Ultimately, I don't mention this in the slides, but ultimately, by two elections later, the two major parties have realized, Labor to the left and Likud to the right, this idea of splitting the vote happened with Netanyahu in 96, with uh, Barak here and with Sharon in 2001, allowing Israelis to vote one ballot for a prime minister and another ballot for the party did that well and scratched it after three attempts because what happened was the two largest parties labor and likud between them used to get about 80 plus or minus of the 120 seats in the knesset so if one party you remember last week i talked about one election where 46 seats were won by labor and 41 by likud that's 87 seats that means that for you mathematicians there are another 33 seats from smaller parties. How do you form a coalition? Very difficultly. And we see that in today's government as well. And the challenges we'll see next week of the four elections in two years that we recently had because of the growth of middle and small parties at the expense of the larger party. So Barack becomes prime minister. His major pledge in the election campaign was to bring home the boys from Lebanon. Um, in fact, there were still about two to three dozen young men soldiers who were being killed in Lebanon in the south with the in the area called the security zone which we maintain with the SLA the South Lebanese army there was a lot of grassroots pressure including a movement called the four mothers movement as you might guess founded by four mothers of soldiers um, who said we need to get out of Lebanon Barak on the 24th of May announced and within one day the headlines you can see the joy in the face of Israeli soldiers Ima Yatsanu Mi Lebanon mom we're out of Lebanon and trust me, there's nothing more as a parent of three, I can say, former soldiers now. When we started this, yeah, we started in January. Our youngest got out of the Air Force December 30th, but he will be for many years in the, in the reserves. But there is definitely uh, a sense of, uh, of joy when there's a ceasefire, as there was in Lebanon, in uh, Gaza in 2014, our eldest was, was there um, amongst mothers, fathers, siblings, everybody in Israel. The UN a month later comes, less than a month, and explores that international border, which was the line agreed upon between France and Britain. Four weeks ago, we explored after the First World War, and the same line of armistice agreed on between Israel and Lebanon in 1949. And voila, we're back to where we were before 
we went in in June of 2000 of 1982. The second major thing of Barack's uh, short term in office was when President Clinton invited Barack and Arafat to Camp David in July of 2000. You might remember last week I talked about the Oslo Accords, how once they were agreed upon in 93 and they began to be implemented in 94, there was a process by which Israel relinquished control in Judea, Samaria, the West Bank, to the Palestinian Authority, and in Gaza, right? The three areas, Palestinian autonomous, Israeli controlled, and shared Israeli-Palestinian areas. And they said, Barak, sorry, Arafat, and his predecessor Rabin said in 1993, 1994, we'll wait five years to talk about the most difficult permanent issues, the final borders between the two entities, settlements, what do we do with those Jews who live in the areas largely Palestinian populated, Jerusalem, Palestinian refugees, and water. No agreement, everything was verbal, and there are different versions as to why it failed. The versions I have read are Israeli and American. Clinton clearly blamed Arafat uh, after the failure of the talks, saying, and I'm quoting President Clinton, I regret that Arafat missed the opportunity to bring that nation into being and pray for the day when the dreams of the Palestinian people for a state and a better life will be realized in a just and lasting peace. It's clear Arafat was blamed both by the Americans and by the Israelis. Israeli Prime Minister Barak said, I believe, that Arafat's, quote, performance geared to exact as many Israeli concessions as possible without ever seriously intending to reach a peace settlement or sign an end to the conflict. Now, Barak, Mr. Military, like Rabin, who we talked about in previous weeks, many Israelis said, hey, He's the most decorated soldier. He's the commander, former commander in chief. He is the former defense minister. If he thinks from a military point of view, who can understand better than, than Barack or Rabin, then I'm willing to support it. But it's clear that Barack, in all of his brilliance, and he really is a brilliant guy, um, many people believe that him and Clinton together were pushing Arafat into a place that Arafat couldn't go to. A couple of reasons, possibly Arafat couldn't agree that Jerusalem should be internationalized. Arafat could not agree to a final agreement between Israel and the Palestinians if Palestinian refugees weren't allowed back in and a few other minor issues. What happens? Barak, criticized within Israel, says, here's what I suggest. We talk about creating two capitals, one for Israel and one for the Palestinians, both of them in and around Jerusalem. Now, it's a very confusing map on the left here, maybe in context, there is Tel Aviv, there is Ben Gurion Airport. This is where I am right now. There is Jerusalem over here. All right. This north of Jerusalem is called Judea, Samaria, sorry, the northern part of the West Bank. Down here, Judea, the southern part of the West Bank. The different colors, the pink Palestinian autonomous zones, the darker yellow here, uh, shared Israeli Palestinian, and the rest of the West Bank, the lighter area, was Israeli. Now, in the middle of this was Jerusalem. And for our purpose on the map on the left, the blue is Jewish and the green is Arab, all right? The Jerusalem municipality, as gerrymandered we saw last week after 67, was within this pink line. And without going into all the details and going really deep into, into focus, I want you to understand that this is the main part of Jerusalem. There is the old city. And south of Jerusalem is Bethlehem, Arab town. And north of Jerusalem is Ramallah, Arab town. Ramallah, of course, is the political and economic center of the Palestinian Authority. And now Barak had an idea that said the following, listen, the world doesn't recognize Jerusalem as our capital. What I suggest is that make everything blue Jewish Jerusalem and everything green can be the Arab capital. So the Palestinians can have con contiguity, territorial contiguity from Ramallah in the north via neighborhoods inside and outside of Jerusalem, all these green areas, and connect down to Bethlehem. We, Israel, will have Jerusalem and three settlement enclaves to the east of Jerusalem, Male Dumim, to the north, Givat Ze'ev, and to the south, the Etzion block. We'll have a much bigger metropolitan Jerusalem than we ever had before. It'll be Jewish. They'll have their capital. And this little thing in the middle, the old city of Jerusalem, will be an international zone open and accessible to everybody. Now, Arafat couldn't agree to that, he said because I am just the leader of the Palestinians. I'm not the leader of the entire Islamic world. It's not up to me to make a decision vis-a-vis -vis Jerusalem. So lots of issues. On the other hand, Barak was criticized internally within Israel for even having the chutzpah, as we said, the audacity to suggest compromising on the foundation stone, right, the epicenter of the Jewish world in the old city of Jerusalem. So that was 2000. 
Um, after the collapse of the discussions at Camp David in July of 2000, the tension between Israel and the Palestinians grew even more. The leader of the opposition, there he is on the right, Ariel Sharon, went up to the Temple Mount in September of 2000, sparking already existing tensions. I would not say that his walk up to the Temple Mount, which led to serious riots and a lot of violence and a few protesters being killed. I would not say, and then the next day on Friday, all over Israel and the West Bank and Gaza, massive protests, 13 Palestinian Israelis were killed. I would not say that Sharon's actions caused the second Palestinian uprising. Intifada. I would, however, say that Sharon's going up to the Temple Mount was another one of the sparks in the Ari Slow Ember fire that existed. Elections in February of 20, 2001, and Sharon defeated Barack by an even greater margin than Barack had defeated Netanyahu just two years beforehand. Right? Same idea, though. We still didn't have Knesset. We didn't even have Knesset elections at the time, and Likud led by Sharon, had fewer seats than the Labour Party, but he was able to form a government, and two years later, he won in the next elections in a very, very big landslide. So lots of changing left and right, and as I mentioned last week, it happens in this country. The greater the amount of violence, the greater proclivity the Israeli voter has toward voting to the right of the political spectrum. So Sharon is elected in February 2001. Violence everywhere. Um, you remember it. Oh, you don't want that actually. You remember it. I don't know how many visit Israel in that time. It's the second, or as the Palestinians called it, the El Aqsa Intifada. El Aqsa is another name for Jerusalem. It's that mosque above the Kotel, above the Western Wall. El Aqsa means the faraway place, and it's connected to the story in the Quran of Muhammad going in a miraculous night journey to the uh, Masjid al-Aqsa, the faraway place, he puts his f foot down, ascends through heaven, um, and comes back down and goes back to what is today Saudi Arabia. That makes that golden dome of the rock the third holiest site in the world. And so for the Palestinians, the intifada, the uprising, remember last week I talked about the first intifada from the word shaking off, that's the Arabic root of it. It wasn't about getting Israel out of Gaza and the West Bank. By their choosing that very terminology, it was about Jerusalem. And so you saw buses in Tel Aviv. This one, in fact, on Allenby Street, somebody I know, I was living in England at the time, her half-brother was killed. Yoni was killed on this bus. He was a medical student. He was a, volunteering, actually, as a, uh, again, as a medic from Again de Vida Dom, wanted to study medicine, and he was on this bus on Allenby Street in Tel Aviv. So it wasn't shaking Israel out of or off of Gaza and the West Bank. It was shaking Israel out of Israel. And if the first intifada in 1987 was largely a wake-up call to the political right in Israel to recognize that the occupation isn't healthy and not everybody who lives under the occupation as enlightened as we want it to be is happy, the second intifada was a blow to the political left in Israel. Because the political left in Israel said, oh, let's negotiate, give back territory in exchange for peace. But it turns out that the territory that many of the violent perpetrators wanted Israel to give back wasn't just West Bank and Gaza, but was all of Israel from the Jordan to the Mediterranean. Very important to realize the internal effect of first versus second intifada. The Dolphinarium incident, you might remember in June, over 20 Young high school students were killed, waiting in line to go into a bar, a bar for underage kids with a, a, a I should say, at the Dolphinarium, across from the Intercontinental Hotel. Thankfully, the Dolphinarium is taken down. You might remember the story of the Karine A. These were weapons seized on a boat in the high seas, somewhere in the Persian Gulf that went from, somewhere in the Red Sea that went from Iran, supposedly to Gaza, Israel intercepted them. This is all off of one boat, weapons destined for Gaza. People still ask the question, why is there a blockade on Gaza? This is one of the major reasons, because if you let the regular guy in brown shorts and a UPS truck deliver something that is sent from North Korea or Iran, this is the kind of stuff that some people in Gaza might actually order. I'm joking, they can't get UPS, unfortunately for them, because it comes to a bus bombing in the city of Haifa. Haifa is a mixed city. One of the worst of the bombings in the Intifada was in a place called the Maxim Restaurant, a joint Jewish-Arab-Israeli-owned um, great Middle Eastern restaurant just on the shore of the Mediterranean as one enters Haifa from the south. Again, the world portrayed Israel, in this case, as Goliath, fighting the little Palestinian David with rocks. 
this image with the Palestinian boy in front of the tank has to be contrasted with this image of the bus here or this bus or maybe this, know, bus after bus. And in Israel, as you all know, a week did not go by without another terror incident and dozens more that managed to be stopped, thankfully, by security personnel. The worst from a numerical point of view of the number of people killed was over 30 people killed Erev Pesach in 2002 when 30 when a bomber came in and put a bomb down in the park hotel in Netanya and murdered all of these people you can see most of them not not very young multi-generations of people coming to tell the story of the freedom of the exodus from Egypt and the freedom of us from slavery um, and this was the straw that broke the camel's back of the new of the government of Ariel Sharon, who had been elected the previous year. And the government of Sharon made two major decisions. One was to launch this operation, Defensive Shield, um, the end of March. And it was the largest land operation of IDF soldiers since the Six Day War to try to go into those autonomous Palestinian areas, A, and find the perpetrators, find the factories making the bombs, find the bombing belts themselves, capture the people. Israel was falsely accused of a genocide. There you can see I'm holding siege to the Mukata, the headquarters and the office of Yasser Arafat in Ramallah. Um, and uh, this is the image from the church as the Greek Orthodox and Armenian monks came into the church in Bethlehem, Palestinian area. Terrorists stormed into the Basilica of Nativity. There was a siege, sorry by the IDF. And of course, Israel was bad guy. Why are we besieging a church while well, they're terrorists inside? There is a massacre in Jenin. Yes, 50 people were killed in the Kasbah, the very dense market area of the city of Nablus. But there were about 12, about 15, 16, sorry, Israeli soldiers killed as well. There was no genocide of thousands of people murdered. It was the consequence of very intense urban warfare, which unfortunately from Lebanon and even more so in the West Bank and Gaza in recent years, Israel has become a very, um, uh, has to deal a lot with the challenges of looking for terrorists and better in civilian populations. So we're accused of having the heavy armor. We have that. Um, and we're accused of having, um, what's the word? They're not uh, not equivalent. There's a word for it. I'll come back in a few minutes. Um, asymmetric warfare. Um, but as I quote, the mayor of New York at the time, um, Michael Bloomberg, who came to Israel in 2014 during the Gaza war, and he was asked at a press conference, he said, but Mayor Bloomberg, how do you explain this asymmetry of warfare? And he said, there can be no asymmetry when it comes to terrorism, which obviously as mayor of New York, the deep scar of 9-11 will always be there in New York City. There can be no equivalency or asymmetry when dealing with terrorists. The second major decision of the government of Sharon was to construct a security barrier. Now, is it a separation barrier? Is it a security barrier? Is it an apartheid wall? I believe, I actually accept the government terminology, it's a security barrier because its main purpose was to slow down, but not totally stop the flow of Palestinian terrorists into Israeli civilian areas where some of them would perpetrate uh, these terror actions. And so the government decided to put up this, let see, let me slide up. The government decided to put up this barrier still not complete, by the way. Um, its decision was in the spring of, of 2002, so less than a month after the Park Hotel. And the idea was quite simply based on Gaza. There's a fence around Gaza. Not a single terrorist had been able to leave Gaza, escape Gaza, and perpetrate a terror act in Israel. Yes, tunnels could be dug and are. Yes, rockets can be shot over and do, but nobody getting out. So let's try to put this up. Now, it's not complete. Only about 8% of it is a concrete wall, which you can see here. This is on the road when I drive from where I live through the West Bank to get up to Jerusalem, around the town of opposite Ramallah and Givad Zev. This is an anti-sniper wall. Most of it is like this electric fence, electronic fence, not electric. Nothing happens if you touch it, but a sensor will go off that will alert security personnel. Oh, somebody's trying to get through there. At the same time, the government builds this. There is a question of what about the people who live on the other side? And how does the government of Israel balance all of the needs of all of the people it is responsible for? On the Palestinian side in Bethlehem, here you can see um, all sorts of street art, graffiti, etc. They're not happy with this 26 foot high concrete wall. My uh, middle child or daughter, uh, one of her best friends, Ayala, spent much of her military service here. 
in this pillbox on the other side in Israel, watching and monitoring what was going on usually on Friday when there are protests um, against Israel and this separation barrier, apartheid wall, whatever term you want to call it. You don't have to come to Israel to see it, by the way. On many university campuses in America, there is Israel Apartheid Week, where the BDS campaign puts up fake walls to kind of illustrate the uh, what Israel is, is doing. But keeping that in mind, realize that when the security barrier began to be built, there were lots of appeals to the Israeli Supreme Court in its capacity as a high court of, a, as a high court of justice from Israelis and Palestinians. And essentially the Supreme Court of Israel said, listen, we have the right, we have the responsibility to ensure that the government, so we have the, we have the responsibility to ensure the government finds this balance between multiple rights, the right to life, which is the first and foremost right that it has to preserve. And Israel had no better answer to try to stop terrorists from coming in from Palestinian areas into Israel, the right to livelihood, and the freedom of movement. How does a Palestinian who lives from where I sit, a mile and a half, that's the West Bank, to come into Israel every single day, um, maybe to work. My, my son, as you, I, I've said probably once, is a contractor. Um, his employees, all Palestinians from the West Bank, all come through a checkpoint. A guy named Rahid was right in this room today, helping. We got a big issue with our water pipe just beyond that door behind me over there. He spent a good four hours in our house today, comes across five days a week, goes back at the end of the day. How do you facilitate Rahid and, and, and 140,000 Palestinians coming into Israel every day to work, um, but yet to protect Israelis? So they've got to go through a metal detector, right? I remember when he came and he redid our bathroom a few years ago, and I was at work. And my wife is at home, and one of her, my wife's girlfriends said, wait a minute, you're at home with the worker in your house by yourself all day? And she's like, yeah, I was. And much of the construction in Israel, by the way, is done by Palestinians. So how do you allow that to happen and protect us against the bad people, not the good people who are out to make a living um, and help in the construction industry? And so the court, under the leadership of the former president, Aaron Barak, said the following. Our task is difficult. We're members of Israeli society. Although we're sometimes in an ivory tower, that tower is in the heart of Jerusalem, which is not infrequently hit by ruthless terror. There are few places in the world where high courts have to sit, and sometimes in their sessions they can hear a bus blowing up literally hundreds of yards away from their window. Regarding the state's struggle against the terror that rises up against it, we are convinced that at the end of the day, a struggle according to the law will strengthen her power and her spirit. There is no security without law. Satisfying the provisions of the law is an aspect of national security. And as such, a number of times, the court ruled and forced the government of Israel to alter the route of the barrier to ensure the negative impact, and there wouldn't be excessive negative impact on Palestinian society, or if there would be, it would be proportional. Um, and I remember again, my eldest son, um, when he was in the military, he was actually, there was a month and a half where they were based right here next to us at Modin, at the checkpoint where now his employees come through every day. And um, at one point, we, uh, it was Friday, and we said, come home for dinner. And he said, I can't, I got to be here. I said, but you can bring me some, don't worry about dinner, bring dessert. So um, he said, but don't come before you call. Fine. So we're about to leave, and he calls us, don't come. An hour and a half later, you can come now. What happened? They were sitting in the, in the war room, and one of the young soldiers saw somewhere along the wall, not too far from where they were, not this section, this is by Jerusalem, um, there was a fence there. And there was a young, a couple of young kids who were trying to get over the fence. Now, were they trying to get into Israel to work the next day? Were they uh, trying to perpetrate a terror act? Were they trying to measure the amount of time it took for the IDF to get, you know, for the armored vehicle to get there and to see what was happening? You know, were they scouting for the, who really knows? But every single day along 720 kilometers of the security barrier, this is happening, um, constant monitoring, again, to ensure the flow of 140,000 Palestinians into Israel every single day, and Israelis who live on the other side of the barrier to come into Israel as well. So it's a complicated reality, lots of challenges, but response number two of the Sharon government. Sharon's government, though, um, Sharon was, is perhaps the most vilified of all former Israeli prime ministers internationally. The Butcher of Beirut is one of his nicknames, apropos what I talked about last week in the war when he was defense minister in Lebanon in 82. But it was Sharon who realized that in the absence of any discussions between Israel and the Palestinians, he proposed a unilateral withdrawal 
from settlements in Gaza, 17 settlements, I think 16, whatever the number was, in Gaza, and four isolated settlements in the northern part of the West Bank. He said, listen, if we see ourselves as a Jewish democratic state, we cannot continue to rule over millions of Palestinians without giving them the same rights as we have, then we're not a Jewish democratic state anymore. But so he said, if we can't talk to anybody, we will unilaterally disengage. The Knesset approved in 2004 this law calling for uh, compensation or, or um, disengagement and compensation. But the problem was that Sharon realized that he had a rebellion. He had 41 members of his party in the Knesset, and 17 of them, I may be off by a number here or there, led by a guy named Benjamin Netanyahu, former and future Prime Minister Netanyahu, were opposed to the idea of Sharon, and they left the government. And Sharon, in order to do so, had to join an alliance with the party of Shimon Peres and the Labour Party. And they supported the government of Sharon. Netanyahu said, it is out of uh, uh, sorry, Sharon said it is out of strength and not weakness. We're taking this step. He lost half of his party. Perez joined him, and in the summer, and the Labour Party, and in the summer of 15, 8,300 Jews were taken down from settlements in Gaza and the West Bank. And um, there were many people who thought that this could possibly lead to a civil war. You can see the officers of the police and the army here trying to take down and take out of the homes the Jews living in the in Gaza. They had said, listen, we settled here after 67. The government encouraged us to come here. What do you mean? And besides, we're rewarding terrorism? Absolutely not. There's still a big internal issue in Israel of those 8,000 plus people who the government forced them to leave their homes, compensation issues, et cetera, et cetera. And what does it say? Shenit Kvardarom lo Ipol. Kvardarom, the village in Gaza, was founded the evening after Yom Kippur. You might remember on my first session about a month ago, the 11 settlements that were found in the Western Negev, the end of Yom Kippur in October 1946. Kfar Dorom was one of them. I said that 10 of the 11 are still there. Well, Kfar Dorom was given up in 48 and given up in 2015 as well. What happens after this disengagement? Sharon's Likud party fractures. Sharon needs the Labour Party to bolster his coalition. And then he decides what is called the Big Bang in Israeli politics to create a brand new party called Kadima. Kadima literally means forward. And in this party, he took Shimon Peres. Don't read all this text here. It's too many numbers. I shouldn't even put this here. Anyway, he decides that um, he is going to create this new party. But he has a stroke. And Ehud Olmert, and his incapacity, and Ehud Olmert was elected the head of the Kadima party. And the elections in 2006, they got more seats and formed a government led by Omer. Omer, however, and here I'll put some of the pictures up. There is Sharon. There is Perez, right? Sharon on the right, Perez on the left in my presentation, but also politically, forming this party of the center. Eur Omer becomes its first leader after Sharon is incapacitated with his stroke. He wins the election, big majority in 2006, but then he resigns. Why? Because he's under investigation for all sorts of issues, including bribery and, and, and perjury, all sorts of stuff. He ends up going to trial, being found guilty, and spends time in jail. And when he's under investigation, the leader of the opposition, a guy named Benjamin Netanyahu, says, you cannot be prime minister and lead the state when you're under investigation. Well, guess what? A decade later, the same thing happens to Netanyahu, and he does not resign. But I'm putting that aside for now. Um, he... Omer steps down and Sippy Livni, there she is, runs and leads the campaign in 2009. Her party gets 28 seats and Netanyahu's Likud gets 27. But what happens in the Israeli electoral system? It's not whatever party gets the most seats, it's whatever party is most likely to form a coalition of at least 61 members. And she was not able to, Netanyahu was able to, and so Netanyahu became prime minister in 2009 and ultimately continued until just last year. And Livni's party went down to six seats in 2013 and has disappeared. Like many parties of the political center in Israel, they come, they last for a few elections, maybe even have significant power, but then they fizzle out. What happens in 2006-7? While Israel is grappling with what to do with Gaza, 
their elections. I mean, we leave Gaza in 2000, we decided in four and we leave in a five. And then their elections in January of 2006 in the West Bank over here and Gaza, this is Israel in between. And what happens in this election was that Hamas, remember last week, the terror organization founded by the Muslim Brotherhood based in, whose main goal is the liquidation of Israel and the creation of an Islamic state between the Mediterranean and the Jordan. They get 44.5% of the vote and Fatah, the PLO, the main branch of the PLO, get a little over 40% and they win the elections, right? Complicated. But what happens? This is a 10 years after the elections in, in 1980, sorry, 1996. It took a decade for new elections because the disagreement between the two major political parties, Fatah and Hamas. Ismail Haniya becomes the Hamas prime minister in March of 2006. And then in the summer of 2017, there is a mini civil war between Hamas, the majority you can see yellow here in Gaza, and Fatah in the West Bank. And Hamas throws out and kills 118 members of Fatah in Gaza. Israel helps move those people who are about to be killed from Gaza to the West Bank. And here you can see sitting in the office of Fatah, the Hamas masked terrorists sitting after successfully kicking out the PLO from Gaza. Ever since, there are now two Palestinian political entities. They don't do business together unless they come together to try to form a national unity government. Hamas committed to Israel's destruction and the PLO's destruction in Gaza and in the West Bank, Fatah, who we talk to and do business with. Uh, phone calls, meeting. Just two weeks ago, there was a meeting by the president of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, in, Ga in West Bank, who came into Russia, Ain, into the house of our defense minister in Israel. So we talk to um, PLO. We don't really talk to Hamas, but we kind of do. On the north, 2006, Israel left in 2000, remember? Hezbollah, still entrenched with their state within a state in southern Lebanon. What happens? An IDF patrol on July 12th, 2006, attacks a couple of Israeli vehicles on, there's the fence, this is the border, there's the blue UN symbol, that's Lebanon. This is a anti a protective fence on the Israeli side that wasn't there in July. These three young men are killed, and these two reserve soldiers are kidnapped, probably um, fatally wounded at the beginning, taken into Lebanon. And this, as Israel retaliates under Prime Minister Olmert, to try to find the boys leads into a 33 day campaign um, where there are hundreds, in fact, more thousands of rockets that come from southern Lebanon into northern Israel. UN passed a resolution calling the ceasefire in middle August, uh, a month plus after the fighting actually began. It called for the withdrawal of Israel, the disarming of Lebanon. We withdrew as the disarming of Hezbollah. They're still not disarmed, as you can guess, deploying the Lebanese army and giving greater power to the UNIFIL presence. But if you look at this picture of before and after, it's a bit hard to see, but these aerial photographs taken by Israel, this is a neighborhood in Beirut, where the headquarters of Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah, are located. And this is what it looked like after the war. Israel pretty much flattened much of that neighborhood. And once again, Israel accused of asymmetric warfare. So. What is the what is the what is the question here? The question is, well, terrorists are shooting rockets intentionally at civilian targets in Israel, and we have F-15s and F-16s and sophisticated weapons and rockets and missile boats and everything else, and we are targeting what? Civilian areas. Why? Because that's where they place the leadership and all of their supplies of the terror organization. When Nasrallah, as I mentioned last week, came out of his bunker, he said, I read the quote over here, if there was even a one percent chance the capturing of the soldiers would have led to a war like the one that happened would i have done it i would say no absolutely not for humanitarian moral social security etc reasons a mensch a real mensch now if you're somebody in lebanon you say to yourself who are these guys yeah they're 40 percent of the population the shiites but seriously every few years there's this massive violence it's not an israeli war against lebanon it's an israeli war against hezbollah big difference ultimately Two years later, the bodies of the Israeli soldiers in a prisoner exchange, dead, their bodies were returned to Israel, um, and that kind of ended the Second Lebanese War. But um, thankfully, since then, 
there has been a restoration of deterrence. I'm not sure I mentioned this last week or the week before. One of the big challenges that Israel has is how do you defend yourself and how do you make sure that your ability to defend yourself is a means to an end rather than end in and of itself? How does power not become excessive? And it's a big problem that Israel faces, particularly when you've got Hamas down over here and Hezbollah over there. Now, Hezbollah is a state within a state. I mentioned last week they're in the parliament, they're in the cabinet as well, and they have the ability to send rockets. This is the range of how far they can go, quite big ones, quite far, almost to a lot down over there, definitely to our nuclear station if we have one somewhere around Dimona just over there, pretty much all over Israel. Thankfully, they're not that accurate, and they're in the midst, as we speak, of trying to figure out a way with Iranian support of having precision guidance systems added to their missiles, which would be an unbelievable game changer. But we think militarily there are between 100 to 140,000 rockets, all of whose purpose is us. There is no place in the world where a terror organization, not a government, I mean, you can say in North Korea to South Korea, whatever, America, Russia, Ukraine, but I'm not talking about that this week. That's next week, maybe. But there's nothing like this anywhere in the world. A terror organization whose fundamental principle is to get rid of us with rockets aimed all over the country at us. And once again, as you saw last week, the breakdown, again, don't look at the fine resolution, look at the different colors to see the ethnic divisions, the purple, most importantly, are the Shia up in the Baalbek Valley over here, lots of heavy poppy and opium. Um, uh, uh, There's a big piece in the New York Times, I think a month or two ago, about the drug business in Lebanon and Syria, largely Hezbollah operated. And there is the large presence of Hezbollah and the Shia population very close to the border with Israel. Um, examples from that war of from a, a great think tank that I spent a lot of time with groups when we go up to the border of Lebanon called Alma in the Upper Galilee. Here you can see these are areas where from the IDF, you can see there's the school, there's the mosque, there's cemetery, and all of these blue and red are places of weapons, uh, uh, rockets were launched from uh, munitions, deposits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, a terror organization, in contrast to an army where their bases and their lines and everything else are fundamentally based inside of civilian populations, and ultimately, and whenever there's an operation slash war that Israel is involved in, we're always accused of this asymmetric warfare. Um, it's not fair. They're in civilian populations. It's their choice that they don't wear uniforms. It's their choice that they put themselves in civilian populations. A little bit farther afield, but also adjacent to us, is Syria. And there was an operation we opened last week, I think in 1981, if I'm not mistaken, with Operation Opera, you remember? Israel destroying the nuclear reactor in Syrac, 10 miles south of uh, Baghdad. In On September, I remember where I was, I remember when it happened, Operation Outside of the Box, Syria was with the help of North Korea, Good old Kim Jong Il. I know you're Chicago people. I know you. You remember Dennis Rodman, but I don't know if you realize that Dennis Rodman is a good friend of the crazy guy Kim Jong Il of North Korea over there. But the North Koreans, like the Iranians, but less capable, love destabilizing the world, and they were supporting the Syrian attempt to try to create a nuclear reactor. Israel sent air force planes a lot shorter distance than we had to to Iraq in 1981. This was the building before, this was the building, this is American government satellite images of it afterwards. Israel didn't say anything about it, but it seems to have been coordinated with the states and with the uh, Turkish president. And just a couple of years ago, it came out publicly that Israel admitted that it had undertaken that operation. Um, I don't know if you've seen this TV series, Tehran, season one, I think season two is about to come up, but very similar story with potential uh, situation in Iran. F-15s, F-16s as well. Um, as I said, it took 12 years till it was it. And like we saw last week, the pilots are putting on their airplanes this little you know, kill symbol if they were involved in the destruction of the Syrian reactor. So twice so far, Israel has destroyed uh, neighboring attempts to create, uh, to create a game changer and have a nuclear reactor with the purpose, obviously, of making bombs that would be targeted to us. The first Gaza operation, and we'll see, unfortunately, a handful of these this week and next week, takes place Hanukkah time, therefore it's called Kasled, end of 2008, early 2019. 
two years after Hamas selection, a year and a half after the coup I talked about over the PLO. And there were indiscriminate rocket fire, which happens occasionally. And there's always the question of at what point does the Israeli government make the decision to respond to this rocket fire that's coming in? What's the cause? It could be some issue that is, it could be Gaza. Uh, it could be what happened in Jerusalem in May of last year. We'll talk about that next week. And Israel decides to launch an attack against Hamas sites December 27th. Um, and for the first time, rockets from Gaza went further, went more than eight kilometers, five miles, but went 25 miles, 40 kilometers outside and hit major population centers like Sheva and Ashdod. Major, major change. Israel declared a unilateral ceasefire brokered by Egypt at the time. and the UN Goldwater, uh, Goldstone report, not Goldwater, accused Israel of the Palestinians of war crime. This was not in this one. This came out at about the same time. No, I even put that in there. But look at the rockets. This is in the basement of a house. These are not very sophisticated. You can see this is a workshop. Some guy with a couple tools takes a, uh, takes a light pole from outside, very easily manufacturing these. But the more sophisticated rockets you can see now, there's Gaza to remind you. It's 40 kilometers long, 25 miles. It's about eight miles wide at its widest and about five miles wide for most of it. Today, about two, 2.1 million Palestinians in Gaza. And the range now to these cities, there's Beersheba, there is the city of Ashdod, Ashkelon close by, populations. All of a sudden, you've got about two million people who are within, no, what am I saying? About a million and a quarter million and a half people who are within rocket range of Gaza Strip. Um, for the first time. Um, big, big change. There are elections in Israel. Now, guess what happens when there are elections in Israel and there's a lot of rockets and a lot of violence going on? People shift to the right. Olmert, as I said, was no longer the leader. Sipi Livni takes over. Olmert said he was proud to be a citizen of a country in which the prime minister can be investigated. Livni runs in the election, loses the election, and it is Netanyahu who gets 27 seats in the election. Again, 27 seats to put in context. If you got 30 seats, you'd be getting 25% of the popular vote. In other words, 23 or whatever percent of Israelis voted for the Likud party, but he formed a coalition ultimately, um, and he has a broad coalition of 74 seats, only 27 of which are of his own. And he said the following in his early speech, the greatest danger of Israel and to mankind will come from a radical regime that will try to arm itself with nuclear weapons. Israel is facing two immense challenges on the economic and security fronts. Our decisions and actions will determine whether we are able to weather the storm. And Netanyahu's leadership from 2009 until 2020, 21, was largely seen through the prism in foreign affairs of dealing with ensuring that Iran will stop um, its program, or its march toward becoming a nuclear power. Shortly after this operation, there is a flotilla that sets forth from Istanbul um, in May of 2010, sponsored by a Turkish Islamist organization and supported by the president of Turkey, Mr. Erdogan, who is still the president of Turkey. And the aim is to take boats and to run through the Israeli blockade. Israel had a blockade because we we're worried about the weapons that you saw 40 minutes ago from the Karine A that Israel captured in 2002. There's a blockade. We limit we can go into uh, into the Gaza Strip. And so every one of the boats except one, there it is, sorry, the Mavi Marmara, decides to surrender to Israel. Whatever humanitarian aid they have, they are going to um, allow Israel to take off, go through the port of Ashdod and deliver it to Gaza as long as it's not something that Israel thinks could be used to make a bomb. Naval flotilla. Uh, one of the most elite forces in the Israel Defense Forces. As they descend from their helicopters, you can see over here in their ropes, they're beaten by clubs and knives, um, and many of them were injured. Ultimately, 10 and 9 at the beginning, and then another one died of the Turkish and, and, and other people on the boat were killed in this violent melee that took place. It led to a serious rupture in Turkish Israeli relations. Ambassadors were recalled, and then Netanyahu just recently actually, apologized to Erdogan a few years ago um, and agreed to financial compensation for the families of those killed on the boat. And Israel and Turkey restored their ambassadors just a few years ago. Our friend Eitan um, 
was the ambassador for about a year and a half until one day Erdogan said, no, 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 no. It was May of 2018 when the embassy opened, the American embassy in Jerusalem, and there was all the violence in Gaza, and Erdogan said, you go home, and literally sent Eitan and his wife uh, back to Israel. And we still don't have an ambassador in Istan, in Ankara, actually, since 2008. What happens in 2010? This event happens in Tunisia, not too far from us, that sparks something called the Arab Spring. A young man, Mohammed Bouazizi, has his merchandise confiscated by the police, totally upset. He douses himself and sets himself on fire. He dies shortly thereafter. And these massive protests forced the Tunisian president to flee. Um, ultimately, the leaders in Cairo um, had to step down again. It spread to Tripoli in Libya. It spread to Sana in Yemen. It spread to Damascus and other places across the Middle East where the very foundation of the Middle East as we know it today outside of Israel was very much uh, and continues more than a decade later to be shaken. Massive, massive collective rage, rest of youth angered by the status quo. And I have a short little video, um, which I'll put on, of the origin of the arts. 2010, a produce vendor in Tunisia stood in front of a government office and set himself on fire, killing himself. His desperate actions helped spark a revolutionary uprising that has come to be known as the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring timeline began in Tunisia a country that had been under the allegedly corrupt and authoritarian rule of President Zain al Abidin bin Ali for more than two decades. On December 17, 2010, a working class vendor named Mohamed Bouazizi was approached by Tunisian authorities about his unlicensed cart. He offered to pay a fine, but instead his vegetables were confiscated and he was publicly humiliated by the police. Afterwards, to add insult to injury, local officials refused to hear his complaints of harassment. In a show of protest, Bouazizi stood in front of the local governor's office and set himself on fire. He died from his injuries on January 4th. Bouazizi became a martyr who inspired others who were suffering from unemployment at the hands of a corrupt government. His death sparked a Tunisian revolution in which protesters armed themselves not only with signs, but with cell phones allowing the protest to spread at social media speed. On January 11th, a week after Bouazizi's death, Tunisia's government fell apart and the disgraced president, Ben Ali, fled the country. The videos of the successful uprising shared via social media raised global awareness of the protests themselves. State-run news organizations were barely able to keep up. The speed and success of the protest inspired others across the region. Throughout January, protests erupted in Algeria, Jordan, and Oman. By January 25th, the movement reached Egypt, followed by Syria, Yemen, Iraq, Libya, and several other countries. On February 11th, Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak stepped down, and by the end of the year, Yemen's government was overthrown. Now, a day does not go by over here. A day does not go by where you do not hear in the news about a, sorry, about, go to the next one, there we go, about, and I'll get to the main screen here, about something happening in the Middle East today. For example, you saw, you might have heard, there was a um, rocket, a few rockets that were sent just the other day from Yemen by the Houthi, a Shia a group in the civil war that is still going on in Yemen toward the Emirates because the Israeli president was there actually a guest of the royal family for a couple of days. So there's still a lot of instability in the Middle East and each country needs to look at differently. I'm going to look a lot at Syria a little bit later today and next week as well. But these events happening 2010 2000, and early 2011 in Tunisia, January 2011. And look, a decade later, they're still protesting. Now, the issues have not been resolved, but it's quite clear that the Arab Spring showed the rest of the world that the instability in the Arab world has nothing to do with Israel. I might have mentioned in previous weeks, there always was this notion that there was the Israeli-Arab conflict that had to do with the fact that um, Israel was occupying Palestinian land, and there will be no progress in any issue in the Middle East until that is resolved. Well, guess what? The issues of wanting more democracy in Tunisia or in Egypt have nothing to do with Israel at all. That same year, by the way, there were protests in Israel. Over what? 
over the price of cottage cheese, over the price of real estate. Tent cities were set up all throughout the main a, a tent, a village, a community was set up all along the main street, Racha Boulevard in Tel Aviv, the fanciest area of Tel Aviv. Major Israeli writers like Mayor Shalev and David Grossman joining the protest, very high cost of living. By the end, in August of 2011, 10% of Israelis were out calling for Am Doresh Tzedek Hebrati. The people are calling for uh, social justice. Now, not a bullet was fired, not a person was injured or killed in any of the protests. And I think to me, that internal protest over the issues that challenge this society are in sharp contrast with the internal issues that define and challenge every other society in the Middle East. We're democracy, we have this election, and we go this way, we go that way, but we have ways of protesting largely by the ballot rather than by the bullet, and unfortunately, it's not quite the same in the rest of the neighborhood. What were the consequences? Well, they managed to stop the uh, massive price increase on, 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 on cottage cheese and a few other commodities. By the way, as I speak to you now, I just got to look at the video because I got a buzz on my phone. Um, there's talk of about 5% increase in basic commodities. In Israel, gas, electricity went up on February 1st, 5.7%. Um, public transport, that was the, the message I got. The finance minister and the transport minister saying, pledging not to increase the cost of public transport. So you know, 5%, people get very, very, very upset. Um, you'll see next week, I'll put a slide up of how effective these protests are. Ultimately, what led to in the 2013 election was the emergence of two important political leaders. And one guy named Yair Lapid formed a brand new party called Yeshatid. There is a future. And out of zero, never existed, his party grew to 19 seats. One out of every six people voted for Lapid. At the same time, another guy named Naftali Bennett led a party called the Jewish Home and got 12 seats. Both of the two, Bennett and Lapid, Bennett is now our prime minister, Lapid is the foreign minister and the alternate, he will be the prime minister next year in a power sharing relationship with Bennett. These two guys had 31 seats and they sat in the government of Netanyahu in order to push forward the agenda of social justice, lowering the cost of, uh, uh, cost of living. They weren't 100% successful, but they pretty much came out of the scene in that election of 2013. At the same time, Israel is leaping and jumping in the startup nation. Shimon Peres, prime minister, way back when at the Davos conference, uh, spoke to Shai Agassi, a uh, young Israeli successful, one of the principals of SAP software in Germany at the time, says, what can you, Shai, and your generation do to make the world a better place? Because as Peres said, our greatest gift is dissatisfaction. So Agassi had this crazy idea of building a battery operated electric car. Go figure, huh? Where is he and where is Elon Musk today? Well, unfortunately, the 800 plus million dollars in venture capital that was raised, um, cars were being manufactured by Renault and uh, uh, the other company, Nissan, I think. And the idea was to have a battery that would charge or a battery that would change. The company went bankrupt, but it helped push forward I think a lot of more understanding and hope to what eventually led to the success, I believe, of Tesla. 2011, and really was that startup, uh, was really one of the, you know, the, um, I remember coming with the Prime Minister's mission actually, from Chicago to visit uh, the Better Place driving area to meet Shai Gus himself back in, I don't know, 10 or 11 or whenever it was, really the poster child of Israel's startup mission. 2011, there is a prisoner exchange Gilad Shalit in the middle, the young Israeli private, flanked by Prime Minister Netanyahu at the time, Defense Minister Barak, and Commander-in-Chief Benny Gantz. Today, he's Defense Minister, today, Leader of the Opposition, today, quasi-retired. There's an exchange for this young man, Gilad Shalit, kidnapped in June of 2006, sitting in his tank on the Israeli side. Hamas had dug a tunnel under the border in the sand, kidnapped him five and a half years, no contact with the Red Cross, no humanitarian connection with his family directly. And it was a controversial act of Netanyahu because it involved exchanging one live Israeli soldier for 1,027 Palestinian prisoners, many of whom were convicted of multiple murders with a lot of blood on their hands in Israel. Israeli parents said, you can't give these guys back to Gaza because they killed our relatives. But then Israeli parents said, but if you, the government, doesn't ensure that 
you do whatever is possible in order to bring our young men back. If they're taken captive, we're not going to send our kids to war. So it's one of those possible dilemmas. I don't have an answer as to which side um, one should have been, but Netanyahu um, really for a number of years had real difficulty in, in dealing with those dilemmas. A year later, Iron Dome, which we'll see now in the next few minutes and next week as well, becomes operational. Um, it begins this crazy second operation pillar of defense, Amud Anan, in November 2012. Israel killed a senior Hamas leader Ahmed, uh, of the Islamic, sorry, of Hamas, Ahmad Jabari. Um, and the idea was to try to, if you knock him off, that will slow down the rocket barrage and the military capabilities from Gaza coming into Israel. Ultimately, it lasted a little bit, uh, a little bit, well, exactly a week, pretty much eight days. Egyptian ceasefire. But this crazy technology, funded um, largely by American taxpayers, but undertaken in about two and a half years at breakneck speed. The technology in one of these batteries, these are all about 25 different rocket interceptors. Radar, you'll see actually in the next picture. You'll see in two pictures, I'll explain a little bit better. But the rockets from Gaza now are getting more sophisticated, not just within five to eight miles of Gaza, not just within 25 miles of Gaza, but now Tel Aviv, me and Modine over here, Jerusalem, Beersheba, pretty much the entire country with rockets that can go a lot farther these days. The idea of Iron Dome is simple, but complicated, in that radar picks up a rocket, shot, and depending on its velocity and its parabola, it determines where it's going to land. If it's going to land in the sea, don't do anything. If it's going to land in an open field, don't do anything. But if it's going to land in a populated area, send an interceptor rocket up, and it will attack this rocket in midair. Here are some of these rockets. This is a woman, Chen Kotler, lives on a kibbutz right next to Gaza. She is a impromptu mini museum in her backyard. This, on the other hand, is the head of a uh, of an Iron Dome. This was a guy running for Congress in 2016, I want to say. He didn't make it, but the rocket uh, did its job and it destroyed an Iron Dome. It destroyed a rocket coming in from Gaza. Here's another image, right, of the protection of the radar and shooting the rockets. And they're not in the same place, by the way. The radar within seconds detects the rocket. And if you live within five miles of Gaza, it can be 15 to 30 seconds before the rocket gets to you from the time you actually hear a siren. So it's amazing how fast this actually works. Again, in terms of distance, I took this picture from my phone on a hill in the town of Sterot, looking toward Gaza. Blue is uh, that where the antenna is, is the border fence. That is Gaza in the background. All the red arrows I put in here, these are all the Gaza Strip. Here is another one of those little rockets that are coming from Gaza. And again, the challenge, investing billions of dollars and hundreds of millions of dollars all the time to keep up the supply of these rockets in order to take one of those things, those Iron Dome rockets, and essentially it's like taking a, I don't know, shooting a Coke bottle out of the air. The truth is it doesn't actually hit the the rocket coming in. It detonates very close to that rocket. You'll see next week some pictures from the latest campaign of this crazy route that the Iron Dome interceptor takes to try to stop the rocket before it actually lands. Of course, when it explodes, there's shrapnel from the Iron Dome interceptor and the rocket coming from Gaza, whether it's a simple homemade little thing like this or a much more sophisticated rocket that can make its way all the way to Jerusalem. But more of that next week in the Iron Dome. I wanted to bring it here to show you this is the first time that it became operational only in November of 2012. Oh, and one other thing. Yesterday in the news, there's a security conference happening in, uh, in Tel Aviv. And our prime minister announced, there's been a lot of talk about this, that very soon Israel will go to the next stage and develop a laser interceptor. So lasers will be able to intercept rockets. And another item was that, and it came up after the uh, discussion, after the rockets were shot to the Emirates, when our president was there from Yemen, was that Israel is considering, Yemen is considering purchasing from Israel the Iron Dome technology to protect itself from the crazy Houthis down in Yemen. Yemen. Crazy neighborhood, huh? Wow. Mike, thank you. <laughs> um, the, I, I know we're sort of over time. So I think what I'm going to say is, I mean, there's no problem with that, but just if you have a question, 
maybe email it to me. I'll get it to Mike and then we can regroup on that next week. I just want to honor the lunch hour that this uh, class is for us. Well, we're supposed to be eating lunch. No, we're supposed to be consuming what you have to teach. So um, for everyone being here, thank you so much. Uh, for those who are here in, uh, those here in Chicago, stay safe. Uh, it is um, snowy and the roads are treacherous. There is at least one person here in Cabo San Lucas. So you enjoy, I won't out you. And- um, I think he, <laughs> for, he outed himself, Rabbi. Did he out himself? Okay. <laughs> And for everyone else, wherever you are, be well. Uh, and we'll see you next week for our sixth and final session. Um, thanks, everybody. Mike, thank you All so right. much. My pleasure. We'll see you all next week. Stay safe.